Well, good evening, friends, and welcome to our webinar. I've been asked the question quite a few times recently. As a standard part of our biological and biostimulant program that we use a lot is a fall application of Rejuvenate and Spectrum. It has some very powerful characteristics. It has an amazing capacity to develop soil biology very, very quickly. And uh, it's become our most popular product because of the results that it delivers for growers. The question has come up quite a few times recently is what is the limiting factor that limits biological development and the development of microbial communities in the soil profile? And how can we develop soil biology much faster? Specifically, how do we know whether a rejuvenated application that we apply on our farm can have the similar effects that it had on our neighbor's farm or, or one of the farms 30 miles down the road. How do we know if we can replicate those results and can replicate that effect? What is the optimal environment in which to apply the product? That, of course, has also been tied in with the question of, of how can we build organic matter and how do we need to manage nitrogen differently based on some of the results that we're seeing. So I wanted to speak to all of those different pieces because they're all connected and they're all tied very closely together. The first piece that I want to discuss and describe is what are the limiting factors for developing abundant microbial communities? And then secondly, once we build really abundant microbial communities, what other management changes might we need to make to ensure that we keep the benefits that we got from all those microbial communities and, and don't negate any of the things that we're doing? The first question, how do we build tremendous microbial communities, particularly uh, if you think of bacteria being uh, m the most rapid or most aggressive example, I've heard some microbiology professors and teachers describe how some bacterial populations, there can be an entire generation in seven minutes of some species. And for other species, maybe the average might be a single generational shift in 20 minutes. Uh, and some, for some, it's a few days. So when you think about that, even if it's just for a few days, but particularly if it's a matter of minutes, when you have this very rapid generational cycle, there's the potential to build incredible bacterial population. The key to building aggressive and very large volume and very abundant microbial communities is to make sure that they have an optimum environment. This is where I think agriculture as a whole has fallen short. If we want to build really active soil microbial communities, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, archaea, etc., every one of these organisms really needs three things. It is usually one of these three things that is missing that will prevent a population from really growing and expanding. So these three are oxygen, water, food, and comfort. And oxygen isn't necessarily a requirement for all species, but it is for many of the species that we want to develop in our agricultural soils. I find this triod of these essential environmental requirements to be a bit intriguing because so often when we think about, okay, what is limiting the development of microbial communities in the soil profile, it's very common for growers to anticipate that the greatest limiting factor is water and that water is what is holding back microbial development, particularly in very dry environments. If we have very dry environments where we're dealing with constant irrigation, such as um, California or Southwest Kansas, Nebraska, Saskatchewan, etc., we often suspect that the greatest limiting factor for microbial development is water, but it's not. It's not water. It's food. In fact, this, I want to describe some of the science behind this, but when, when there is an adequate level of digestible carbon and soluble carbohydrates in the soil profile, biology can access enough water, even in drought conditions where plant roots can't get enough water. And I want to describe a bit how this works. So um, obviously the, the first requirement and, and a requirement that I believe it is important for us to discuss is oxygen and making sure that we have adequate oxygen in the soil profile. The ideal that there's, this often raises the question of tillage versus no-till and how, how do we fix a hard pan or a plow pan if we have one in the soil profile? 
Um, first of all, it is completely unacceptable to only be tilling the top four to six inches of the soil profile, only be farming the top four to six inches of soil profile. If we have a hard pan and roots are not penetrating below that level, then we need to get rid of the compaction. We need to resolve the compaction issue. From my observation, my experience, there's, there are many who would advocate seeking to remedy a plow pan or a hard pan by using plant roots, by using cover crops, et cetera, tillage, radish, and so forth. And those are certainly a very valuable tool. However, in my observation, in my experience, uh, they're often not enough and too slow. The most effective tool in our observation is actually using iron, using machinery and equipment, using deep rippers to uh, aerate the soil profile, and then using cover crops and using plant roots to maintain that openness and to make sure that that compaction doesn't develop again. So it is important to make sure that we have good aeration and oxygen flow in the soil profile. And also, this is something that uh, Rejuvenate can help with tremendously. Uh, it's one of the, the common attributes and the common reports that we hear from growers who are using it is that their soil becomes much softer. And it can become softer quickly with a rejuvenate application down to 10 to 12 inches. But in the cases where we have severe compaction, uh, rejuvenate is still not a compaction remediation tool in and of itself and by itself. So we have to address this issue. This is something that can't be allowed to continue if we want optimum crop health and crop production. But the second piece then that we need to look at is water. And here's, here's why water is not the problem that we might anticipate that it is. So when soils are at field capacity with moisture, at field capacity essentially means that the soil can't hold any more water. If you had a vertical soil column and you add one more drop to the top, then one drop is going to come out of the bottom. The, the soil can't hold any more in that soil structure. So that is, that's what is termed a field capacity or stated a different way, 100% moisture. So 100% of moisture holding capacity. When we have powdery dry soil that is dusty dry, that will blow in the wind, when you measure the water held within that soil profile, dusty dry soil still contains 70% of fuel capacity. And you ask, yourself, how is that even possible? How is it possible that completely dry soil can still hold, be holding 70% of the water that is at field capacity? And the reason for this is because as soil begins drying out, there is this very thin film of water that is around each individual soil colloid, each clay colloid and silt particle, sand particle, etc. And that water is adsorbed to these colloids very, very tightly. So tightly that uh, it is not available to plant roots. Plant roots can't absorb it, and but biology can. In fact, bacteria can still live and maintain viable populations in these thin films of water. Mycorrhizal fungi can access this water. And, and this is one of the reasons why one of the characteristics that mycorrhizal fungal inoculated plants are known for as being much more drought resilient because mycorrhizal fungi can tap into these thin films of water on the soil colloids and make them available to plants. So in fact, soils that would appear to us to be completely dry still have an abundance of water and they have enough water to maintain and to develop a strong microbial community. So it's not water that is the limiting factor in most agricultural soils. What is the limiting factor usually is a food source, which is soluble carbon. What do I mean when I say soluble carbon? It's a bit of a challenge to speak about the different carbon fractions and the carbon profile of what's happening um, with soil organic matter because there is so much different terminology being used today. Some speak of green carbon and brown carbon versus black carbon. Um, some speak of, of uh, undegradable carbon or un indigestible carbon, humic substances, etc. And, and none of those 
typical descriptions fit very easily for what I want to describe. So for this discussion, what I'm, what I'm referring to is a fraction of a part of organic matter. So if you take this total organic matter, there is a part of that organic matter that is extremely stable. It's sometimes referred to as stable humic substances or humus. And um, for the sake of this discussion, we're going to simply define that the, the stable humic substances as being insoluble carbon. In other words, they cannot be consumed, they can't be used as a food source by biology. And this is, this is an important point to be aware of because sometimes um, people recommend the application of humic acids or fulvic acids or humates to say, oh, those are a food source for fungi or those are a food source for biology. And that is, that is not correct. Humic substances are the end result of microbial decomposition, which means simply that they can't decompose any further. They can't be digested any further. They are no longer a viable energy source and a food source for fungal and bacterial populations of soil profile. However, what they are is they provide a house. Uh, they, they provide a, a structure in the soil that biology can thrive in and can live in. If we think about the sum total of organic matter, we can divide that total organic matter into two large fractions for the sake of this discussion. That part of organic matter which is structural in the soil profile and that which is soluble. Sometimes we work with farmers who apply a compost tea onto some fields or onto some farms and they get a tremendous response. The soil responds, the crop responds, uh, that you say increased crop growth, increased yields, increased performance overall. And then they apply it onto other fields or other growers in the same area apply it and they get very minimal response or very little response. From my observation and our experience, the big difference between these two has nothing to do with water. Oxygen and aeration can be a limiting factor. Another possible limiting factor can be historical pesticide applications, particularly his, the historical use of Roundup. All others as well, but we see Roundup is, is a major application that really can have a long-term residual effect on soil biology. The big difference between those soils that get a wow response and those that don't is the proportion or the presence of soluble carbon, that soluble or matter fraction soil profile. And this is very interesting. Uh, I want to describe that this there is not a necessarily a correlation between total organic matter and soluble carbon. So it is possible to have a soil rich black topsoil in Iowa or Illinois that has 5% organic matter and have no soluble carbon present. And conversely, it is possible to have very sandy soils in Idaho or Florida that have a half a percent of organic matter, but they have abundant soluble carbon and you get a tremendous microbial response. So it's not just about the total organic matter, but it is specifically about the organic matter that is present and can be digested by biology and used by biology as a food source. So we've worked with some farms who have applied rejuvenate and spectrum as a fall soil application spray onto the soil in conditions that uh, as growers, we would refer to as being bone dry, where it's completely dry. There is no obvious moisture. We're in drought conditions and, and we appear to have drought stressed soils. And yet we still get a very strong response. And it's because biology can actually tap into water that doesn't appear to be visible and doesn't appear to be present to us in the films on the soil colloids. There's a second source of water for biology as well, though. Uh, this is something that Bruce Tainio used to speak about. When you think about water, water is uh, water and carbon dioxide are used to build plant biomass. They're used to build carbohydrates and, and physical plant structures. And, he, and Bruce used to describe how 
as biology degrades carbon and crop residues in the soil profile, they can actually create the water that they need for their own requirements. Not a surplus, but they will, they will create enough for themselves from the digestive process of plant residue. So in the process of degrading that plant residue, they recapture and regain some of the water that was actually used to build that, uh, to build that biomass originally. So when we think about developing soluble carbon in the soil profile, the question that we have to ask, of course, is how do we build much higher levels of, in other words, how do we put more apples in the soil for the soil biology? So the, the key to building soluble carbon is with, by incorporating, by, by harnessing the photosynthetic energy, uh, harnessing the photosynthetic factory called plants. We can do this with cover crops. We can also do this with the crops that we're producing and that we're growing. Specifically, the fastest way to build soil organic matter is with root exudates and root biomass. Uh, you can also do this with crop biomass and above ground soils, um, crop biomass, but root exudates and root biomass are the fastest and the most effective. However, it's not just a question of building soluble carbon, but also keeping it. And this is where we get into a conversation about nitrogen management, because in fact, what we've observed is that many farmers have the capacity to build higher levels of soluble carbon, but they are systemic, systemically losing it because of the way that they manage nitrogen. They're, they're essentially consistently burning off all their soluble carbon with nitrogen applications. When you have really healthy plants, strong photosynthesis, above 60% of photosynthetic capacity, that will change how sugars and carbohydrates move in plant roots uh, and, and move to the different sugar sinks. And we know that when we have, just as a general rule of thumb, when we have really healthy plants, that 50% of the total carbohydrate and total sugar production from photosynthesis is going to go into the below ground profile, into the root systems and out through the roots as root exudates. And when we think about that, that's not, by the way, that's not a normal crop, that's an exceptionally healthy crop one that is photosynthesizing well. This is not what you see when you drive through Iowa in Illinois looking out from a pickup truck window. Just because plants are nice and green doesn't mean that they're photosynthesizing well. So when they are photosynthesizing well and you have 50% or more of the sugar production going out or going down to the root system and out through the root exudates, when you partner that information with something else that is quite interesting, this is from um, Dr. Christine Jones and her, the research, some of the research that she's organized and assembled from Australia is she describes how 70% of the total carbon that is present in root exudates and 50% of the carbon in root biomass and 30% of the above plant biomass contribute to increase organic matter. Or another way of saying that is that they contribute to the long-term carbon reserves in the soil profile. And in that process, they are a soluble carbon source for soil biology. And when you look at those numbers, all of a sudden, that means that the importance of root exudates and root biomass increases substantially because they have a much bigger impact on soil biology than the above ground part of the plant that we can see. I also believe that part of the reason why only 30% of the above ground plant biomass contributes to increasing organic matter is because uh, it's, it's partially because of oxidation, loss of crop and cover crop vegetative biomass as CO2 into the atmosphere. And it's also particularly in commercial farming systems due to how we manage nitrogen. So I wanna talk about nitrogen a little bit. Fall nitrogen applications from a soil health perspective are one of the dumbest things that you can do. I, I shock myself a little bit by being so blunt about how damaging nitrogen applications are, but I've tried to speak about this in politically correct terminology for some time and the message doesn't seem to be getting through. Fall, fall nitrogen applications are agronomically the most unsound, dumbest things that we can do. They make absolutely no sense. It makes no sense to apply nitrogen six months before the crop requires it, 
and give it six months to leach and to volatilize, and most importantly, to interact with the carbon in the soil profile and degrade it and oxidize it and release it into the soil and into the atmosphere. It makes no sense whatsoever. It doesn't make agronomic sense. Uh, and it just, I don't understand why, I don't understand why we started doing it in the first place. And I don't understand why we continue doing it. I guess when I say that, um, I can say, yeah, I understand why people started doing it because uh, purely because of logistics, it's at a time of year when not much else is happening and it's easier to do. And uh, it's not in the summertime or in the springtime when we have lots of other things going on. That's no excuse. If I were to tell you that you could save 40% of your nitrogen application by putting it on in the spring or in the summer, does that saved money that you saved by putting 40% less on pay for the additional hassle of putting it on in the spring? I think it more than it pays for it. I mean, who... Who is the fall nitrogen application really best for? Is it best for you, the grower and the farmer in your crops, or is it best for the retailer who's applying the product? You have to ask yourself these questions. And you have to ask these, yourself these questions if you care about soil health and care about building your soil microbial communities, because really what I'm talking about, and the reason I'm emphasizing this so much is because if you want to build soil microbial communities and build organic matter and build soil health, then you need soluble carbon to do that. And if you want to get rid of soluble carbon in your soil profile really quickly, the most effective thing that you can do is apply nitrogen in the fall, particularly anhydrous ammonia. Because what happens is when you have stable, stable humus, humic substances, stable organic matter, stable organic matter in the soil, will, or, or carbon, I'll, I'll use the word carbon, carbon in the soil will stabilize. Um, I'm now, right in this moment, I'm struggling to put a number to it because the number varies depending on what test you're running. There's different types of tests and um, you, want, you need to be aware of the tests that you're using. But for some types, some, for some analysis, some types of tests, the desired value for carbon and nitrogen is a 10 to one ratio and others it's as much as a 20 to one or even a 30 to one ratio. So with that caveat aside of the different testing modalities, let's just say sim very simply that when you add nitrogen, soluble synthetic nitrogen to the soil profile, you rapidly narrow the nitrogen to carbon ratio. So instead of being a 10 to one ratio, let's say for the sake of discussion, now you go to a six to one nitrogen to a carbon nitrogen ratio. And when you narrow the ratio, that now means that the nitrogen that has been applied is being converted to nitrate, NO3, and the processes that you have released in the soil profile are going to result in degrading the carbon that is present and releasing it as carbon dioxide in massive quantities, in very large quantities. So, if you want to, I can, just the simplest way to say this, and then I will stop ranting, is that don't expect to build soil organic matter while you're applying 100 plus units of nitrogen in the fall, or even 60 units of nitrogen in the fall. Don't expect to build organic matter while you're doing that. You're going to degrade organic matter by doing that. And it doesn't make sense from a soil health perspective. It also doesn't make sense from an agronomic and a crop nutritional requirements perspective either. So think about that and um, hopefully, and also the reality is you don't have to believe anything that I say, um, simply try it. Try a nitrogen application during the growing season as compared to a fall application. And uh, since we've started using SAP analysis, it's not uncommon for us to start working with a farm and cut their nitrogen applications by anywhere from 30 to 60%. And in a few cases, even as much as 70%. And that's a very, very big number. But a SAP analysis is telling us exactly how much nitrogen the crop has and how much it's getting. And the analysis is telling us that the crop has abundant nitrogen, it has plenty of nitrogen. We don't, we don't need to add any more. And the reason we are adding so much, occasionally we hear 
the growers describing how um, you need so many units of nitrogen to grow a bushel of grain, you need a pound of nitrogen to grow a bushel of corn. And yet we have many growers who are growing a bushel of corn with um, 0.7 pounds of nitrogen or 0.5 pounds of nitrogen. That is including cover crop and manure based nitrogen. So, and they're building organic matter while that is happening. So the idea, a pound of nitrogen, first of all, a pound of nitrogen is not a pound of nitrogen. Amino acids and, and um, urea behave very different in the soil and plants from ammonium versus nitrate. I read a very interesting article recently. I'm trying to remember where it was. I can't remember. I can't recall off the top of my head. But research being conducted, I think, in Iowa, if I am not mistaken, um, indicating this was radio, using radioactive labeled nitrogen that plants only absorb 20% of the nitrogen that is being applied. Some of it is leached and volatilized, and some of it is, is retained in soil microbial communities and microbial bodies but a lot of it is lost and it doesn't make, we, we're, we are grossly over applying nitrogen on many of the crops that we work with. So our solution, our recommendations, if you want to build microbial communities, if you want to build organic matter and build soil health, the first priority is you, you need to build high levels of soluble carbon with really healthy crops and strong photosynthesis that are sending a lot of root exudates out through the root system. And step two, you apply nitrogen only as needed when needed. You don't put on full applications of nitrogen. And the third piece is that you stabilize your nitrogen applications with sulfur using ammonium thiosulfate in a 10 to 1 ratio with the applied nitrogen, uh, using carbon humic substances such as humicarb at 3% of the tank solution, and molybdenum uh, to reduce your application requirements. And uh, again, based on SAP analysis and field experience, it's, I can very confidently say that many growers can reduce their nitrogen applications by a minimum of 30% and probably more. And the advantage, the strength of working with SAP analysis is that you're actually measuring it. You don't have to guess. You know exactly what the plant's nutritional requirements are and you know when you have enough and you know when you don't need to add any more. I'll, I'll expand a little bit on nitrogen stabilization. The, the easiest types of nitrogen applications to stabilize are those that are occurring in liquid form, uh, although you can certainly do dries as well. We like to add three components. First is we add ammonium thiosulfate, let's say to liquid 32 or liquid 28, whatever the grower is applying, such that we get a 10 to one nitrogen to sulfur ratio in the mix. So let's say if we're doing uh, liquid 28, and ammonium thiosulfate is uh, 120026, then we would do a nine to one ratio, nine gallons of 28 to one gallon of thiosol. And that will give us a roughly 10 to one nitrogen to sulfur ratio, which is enough for the biology in the soil to rapidly absorb that nitrogen, incorporate it into microbial cells and hold it stable in the soil profile. Um, and we ha there has to be enough sulfur to hold that and stabilize it, otherwise, uh, to, to build amino acids in that microbial population. Otherwise, the nitrogen is just going to continue to cycle and to release. And the second piece that we would add would be humicarb at 3% of the liquid solution uh, of either 32 or 28. And um, actually, the, the, optimal, the optimal form of nitrogen for application during season, in season, or at the beginning of the season is urea, including liquid urea. And um, at, in different parts of the country where we've worked with growers in local regions, um, they've worked with local suppliers to actually develop sources of liquid urea, which is I think a 2100, uh, if, it's, it's, if it's a pure solution urea. And that product performs extremely well. We get very nice crop responses. And um, going back to a comment that I made earlier, a pound of nitrogen is not a pound of nitrogen. They are not all the same. You can get a much greater crop response with urea than you can with say liquid 28 or liquid 32. And you can actually put on less, fewer pounds of nitrogen and get a greater crop response, which is something that I find really intriguing. It also explains the, the same is also true of amino acids. Uh, organic growers increasingly now have some much better resources for uh, water-soluble amino acid powder that can be 
put in water and sprayed on or put on an irrigation system. And a few pounds per acre of amino acids produce this tremendous crop response. And in fact, I would say it's safe to say that a pound, one pound amino acids per acre will give us on a sap analysis and uh, in terms of plant performance, will perform to the equivalent of about um, five to seven pounds of nitrogen in the form of liquid 28. And there's, there's lots of biochemistry reasons for why that happens, but the, the bottom line, the simple explanation is that amino acids contribute energy to a plant, whereas nitrate and ammonium detract energy from a plant and require energy from the plant to process. So uh, you end up getting a very, very different plant response. First question that has come through, um, do your recommendations about not applying nitrogen in the fall also apply to tree fruits? This is a, this is a good question, Iran. So in tree fruit, there is the need, we, we often see benefits from applying small amounts of nitrogen uh, to the tree, to the foliage itself, just before dormancy in order to build really healthy, high quality buds. So we, it's very common to apply urea, a fall urea applications as a foliar just before dormancy. And that is a very valuable application. Um, however, that is a bit different. And those applications typically um, are being applied at rates anywhere from 10 to 20 pounds of actual nitrogen, occasionally more than that. But uh, we see very good results with 10 to 20 pounds of actual nitrogen per acre. And this is a bit different from what I'm referring to, so that this is a, a plant application, which is valuable. Where I would be very concerned is if that nitrogen were being applied to the soil. Even having a urea or any type of nitrogen application to the soil in the fall doesn't really make sense from my perspective. Jacob William, glad to see you here. Um, question, is there an ideal ratio of molybdenum as uh, an addition to nitrogen application similar to the 10 to one ratio for sulfur. Molybdenum, we, we haven't developed a ratio for molybdenum in nitrogen applications. We're more commonly looking at the molybdenum that is present in the soil or in the plants already. And I realize I'm speaking here to a soil application. So when soils have adequate molybdenum, we, which is cell on the case, we often add, let me just say that we typically add, I'm trying to think back, um, we typically add a quart per acre of molybdenum to 20 gallons of nitrogen, 20 gallons of a liquid 32 or liquid um, 28, and a quart of molybdenum is at 6% moly, if I recall correctly. So that is kind of the standard application that we use, and that's, that may not be perfect, may not be right, but that's what we're using at this point. Greg Stack, glad to, glad to see you here tonight. We have a couple of questions. I have results from the Haney soil test through War Labs. Will this tell me how much soil bicarbonate is the soil profile? More organic matters at 4.3%. Yes, Greg, thanks, thanks for asking that question. I, I should have mentioned War Labs and I've heard that Midwest, I haven't actually seen any results, but I've heard that Miss Midwest Labs is now also running and conducting the Haney soil analysis. And that soil analysis does tell us how much soluble carbon is in the soil profile. And um, it correlates from what I've been able to observe so far, that soil analysis correlates very well with what is actually happening in the soil profile from a soil biology perspective. And uh, I think it's a very valuable tool. It's something that we are using more and more at AEA and it's something that I'm recommending very frequently to our growers. It's the least inaccurate soil health analysis that we have at this point, from my perspective. Greg, uh, your second question, I found from my last SAP analysis from a few weeks ago that grape plants are extremely high with magnesium uh, off the chart. And nitrogen is the antidote for excess of magnesium. Can this be safely applied as a foliar this time of year before first frost? Greg, you're asking a very good question from a, from a plant health perspective. I, I'm not, I would actually, I'm not concerned about the high magnesium um, unless it is causing deficiencies of calcium. So unless you have a calcium deficiency problem, 
I wouldn't be too concerned about the high magnesium. Your, your high magnesium is not going to have any negative plant health effects or any negative plant health consequences, whereas applying nitrogen can. So um, I wouldn't, I don't think I would recommend a nitrogen application in the fall uh, as you approach dormancy because you have the potential to weaken the vines um, from a frost resistance perspective. So uh, I would actually just leave the, leave the magnesium alone and then look at, see what it looks like next spring, unless you are observing um, severe calcium deficiencies. And, e and even in that case, it's, it's probably too late to do much of it, to do much with it for the remainder of this year. And something that we need to look at systemically addressing for the next year, for next year's crop. Darren Petzer asked the question, um, do amino acids and protein nitrogen act similarly in the soil? I.e., if plants can absorb amino acids, will protein nitrogen be broken down to amino acids and be absorb, absorbed as such, or will the protein nitrogen be converted to nitrate? Uh, Darren, this is <laughs> a very thoughtful question. I would say you could almost use protein nitrogen and amino acid nitrogen as, as an equivalent for each other uh, in terms of how they are processed in the soil profile. So what happens is when you have microbial communities, particularly bacterial communities, as they absorb nitrogen, either from applied nitrogen or from the air, once we stop applying nitrogen, whatever the source is, they will convert some of that to amino acids, so, or all of it to amino acids. So the microbial process, if you have, if plants are absorbing nitrogen from the soil biology, it will almost universally be in the form of amino acids in my understanding. When plants are absorbing nitrates and ammonium is when there has been a great deal of applied synthetic nitrogen more than the biology has the capacity to process. And that is when you get absorption of nitrates and ammonium. Nitrates and ammonium um, don't exist in large concentrations in soils that have really aggressive and really active microbial communities that haven't had applied synthetic nitrogen. That's, that's my understanding of, of how nitrogen works in the soil profile. So the answer to your question is that um, proteins will be degraded and consumed by biology as and converted to amino acids and then will be absorbed as amino acids. Dennis Pashevitz, if nitrogen is so destructive to the soil and takes so much energy by the plant to process, why do we get such a good response from it? Dennis, it's uh, the simplest analogy to describe it is to say that it's a drug response. Um, so you get a good response from it for two reasons. One is you, the, the freely available and readily available nit nitrogen does give us a strong plant nitrogen response and a growth response as a result of the readily available nitrogen. The second is that you also get a flush of carbon dioxide. And in fact, I believe in many cases, the, carbon, the flush of carbon dioxide from oxidized organic matter is a greater contributing factor than the nitrogen itself. And when growers and farmers were still cultivating uh, for weed control and for soil aeration, many corn growers would know and understand that you cultivate corn and you get this very strong growth flush that will last anywhere from, uh, it'll start for a few days, it might last as much as a few weeks after the first cultivation where you get this very rapid growth response. It was commonly described as, oh, that growth response is coming from nitrogen. That's not coming from nitrogen. That's coming from carbon dioxide, CO2. As, you, as the cultivator goes through, you inject air and oxygen into the soil profile, and you release carbon dioxide, and you get a CO2 response. So that's not a nitrogen effect. It's a CO2 effect. And when you apply synthetic nitrogen, you also get the CO2 effect because you're losing organic matter. The, the problem is that you have all of these unintended negative side effects from the synthetic nitrogen application. Point, I would say simply, is that from experience, side-by-side -side applications on a number of different farms, uh, you can get 
the exact same degree of plant growth and yield and higher quality with less nitrogen by managing other nutrients and by managing soil biology. So you, I would ha have to ask you the question, what do you, f what do you define as a good response? Because you may get a good crop response, but you're having a very negative long-term soil health effect. Anthony Granatelli, glad to see you here tonight. Um, how about fall application of nitrogen to fruit crops in tropical or warm subtropical areas where the winter is short and mild? Again, similar to what, uh, how I responded to uh, apple production, there is a difference in nitrogen application on plants versus soil. The substantial negative that I'm referring to occurs from nitrogen application to the soil. So uh, nitrogen application to plants at the right time to give us very large buds uh, and to give us optimum bud health is not necessarily a negative thing. Um, it can be very useful and very valuable. It's a very good question. Lady Fogel, uh, follow-up question. When using exclusively amino acid nitrogen, what forms will the plant take up? Uh, it's my understanding that the plant will take up great majority in the amino acid form. And also, uh, actually one of the pieces that I, I failed to describe earlier is when, um, when you have abundant microbial communities and when you're applying amino acid and protein nitrogen and not nitrate and not ammonium, plants will primar primarily pick up amino acids and urea. I failed to include urea. So urea or amine nitrogen is also a microbial, um, a byproduct of microbial metabolism and they, will, they can also absorb urea. Um, so I would like to include that with my previous conversation of amino acids. It's not exclusively amino acids, but it also includes urea. Reed Lundgren asks a question, um, the CN ratio, is that structural carbon such as humic and fulvic or soluble nitrogen? I've read the best environment for microbial activity is 24 to one, is that too high? I banned on humic acid and manure compost in the fall. It seems to be helping my organic material, but could be the wrong soil test. So uh, read the, the answer to your question is the optimal carbon to nitrogen ratio is going to be dependent on the test that you're running. Ask the laboratory. Um, the, the laboratory will often have a range. And if you have a question, uh, if, if you question whether your, your laboratory really understands and knows what they're talking about, I would suggest considering a Haney soil analysis by Ward Labs because um, they are very closely paying attention to soil biology and the optimal environment that is required for really aggressive microbial populations. And then you can know and understand exactly what is happening and what is going on. Lighty, I see your follow-up question. Um, when using amino acid, nitrogen, or urea, does free nitrate go away? So when you use amino acid, nitrogen, or urea, and I keep circling around this caveat of active microbial community. So when you have really active bacteria in the soil profile, and let's say, let's say for the sake of discussion that you add nitrate, that nitrate will be immediately consumed and held within bacterial cells and converted to amino acids. You can think of it almost as a fermentation tank, if you will. There is no nitrate existing in a fermentation vat for very long unless you apply more quantity of nitrate than the microbial community can consume. So the nitrate nitrogen that gets added gets quickly consumed and converted to amino acids. So there should not be nitrate in a really healthy soil profile and um, Similarly to that, the plants will also not absorb very much nitrate as well, and nit um, nitrate in plants should disappear also. Thanks, Lighty. A couple more questions here. Uh, Jillian Julius asked the question, is there something that can be applied initially to help boost microbial communities prior to cover crops getting established? was planning to apply humic acids. Is that a bad idea or useless? 
Okay, Jillian, this is, this is a good question. Um, humic acids are, they're not a bad idea and they're not useless. Although I think there may be better ideas. And what I would recommend an, is an application of rejuvenate and spectrum, uh, particularly rejuvenate. Rejuvenate would be, is, rejuvenate contains humic acid but it is more than humic acid. So um, you, the, you're putting on a humic ap acid application can help because it, can st it serves as a stimulant. It can stimulate soil biology, but it doesn't provide a food source to kickstart soil biology. And it, it also doesn't serve as an inoculant if there are any uh, species that are no longer present that you may want to add. So it's not a bad idea, but uh, in our experience, uh, and I, I've worked a lot with humic acids over the years, I think there are more effective things that you can do that will give you a much bigger crop response and a much bigger soil response as well. Kenneth Peters asked the question, in cases where we only apply ammonium sulfate, the nitrogen sulfur ratio would be higher. Uh, yeah, it's actually, there's more sulfur than nitrogen present, 210026. Uh, would you apply a different source of nitrogen as well? than to help balance that out. No, not necessarily. You don't need to. The, the additional sulfur, many soils need the additional sulfur and uh, it's, it's not really a problem. In fact, it's a benefit. So uh, you don't need to apply any additional nitrogen just to try to balance that out. James Pingree asks a very good question. Glad to see you here, James. Can a good microbial community help with nitrate-induced diseases? Yes, it can, because as I described a moment ago, when you have an abundant microbial community, your presence of nitrates in the soil profile should be essentially zero. It should be very, very low. And um, then your follow-up question, should molybdenum also be a tool to help reduce nitrate-induced diseases? And the answer to that is yes. Um, so when you have nitrates in plants, there are three nutrients. Um, magnesium, sulfur, and molybdenum. When you have adequate levels of magnesium, sulfur, and molybdenum in the plant profile, nitrate levels will go down to zero to be a non-detect very reliably, very consistently. And so you can remove nitrates from the plant sap very quickly by using those. And all three of them need to be adequate. If you have enough, uh, let's say you have enough um, sulfur and molybdenum, but you don't have enough magnesium, you're not going to be effective. So all three of them need to be present in, uh, in adequate amounts. So those are all the questions. Um, thank you very much for attending the webinar. I hope that you found it useful and enjoyable and um, each of you will receive a follow-up email with a slide deck as well. Have a good evening and uh, happy growing. Talk to you again soon.